The following is a presentation of Appalachian State University. Vatican astronomer brother Guy Consolmagno has spent his entire career exploring the connections of science, religion, and society. A prolific writer, he has authored numerous books, including the bestseller, Turn Left at Orion. Brother Consolmagno has taught at several well-known universities, including Harvard and MIT. His scholarly work addresses how to move from an emotional appreciation of the stars to a deeper understanding of reason and truth. We'll meet this intriguing scientist coming up on Appalachian Perspective. Welcome to Appalachian Perspective. My guest today is Brother Guy Consamayo, curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection in Italy. He's visiting campus as a guest lecturer. Welcome, Brother Guy. It's, it's good to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being part of our institution and lecturing to classes. It's always an honor to have you on our, on our campus when we can. You've had an impressive and an interesting career from your early days of uh, working and teaching at Harvard and MIT to serving in the Peace Corps to your current position at the Vatican. Tell me how this diverse uh, background prepared you, and tell me how did you get to the Vatican? That's a big deal. <laughs> it is, and it's totally by accident. Yeah. It feels every step of the way like it was by accident. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you look back at the, and you see the pattern uh, there's a favorite right. uh, phrase that one of our priests in the observatory says, God writes straight with crooked lines. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. a crooked line that got me directly to where I'm going. Mm -hmm. As a young man, I was one of these people who wanted to learn everything. You know, mm -hmm. I was fascinated by astronomy, but I was also a space kid. I, I started kindergarten the year that Sputnik went up. Oh, I was in yeah. high school when people were landing on the moon. How could you right. not be in love with space? Mm -hmm. My best friend was going mm -hmm. to MIT, so I decided to just go there and read science fiction and explore the tunnels and things. Mm -hmm. Almost by accident, I fell into the Earth and Planetary Science Department. I saw planets, I thought that was astronomy. It turns out it was geology, but geology of the other planets. And when I found out that there are rocks that actually come to us from space called meteorites, I realized right then, this is something I really wanted to study. Mm -hmm. I carried on that study at Arizona, and then did postdoctoral work at Harvard and MIT, and I was I was in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. I was a utility infielder, but I was in the big leagues, and this was mm -hmm. great. And then I approached my 30th birthday, and I would lie in bed and wonder, why am I wasting my time wondering about rocks from space when people are starving in the world? Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many other bigger mm -hmm. problems. Why do astronomy when there are so many more important things to do? And I didn't have an answer. So finally, I gave up my job at MIT, and I volunteered for the Peace Corps. And I told them, I'm going to go anywhere in the world you want me to go. I'll do anything you ask me to do. So within three months of arriving in Kenya, I was at the University of Nairobi teaching oh, wow. astronomy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the very thing I thought was worthless. Mm -hmm. But the Kenyans taught me why it matters that Every weekend, I'd go up country where my other Peace Corps volunteer friends were, the ones who were really in the Peace Corps, you know, in the, in the, the rural areas. And I had a little telescope, and I'd set up, and everybody in the village would go and want to look at the moons of Jupiter. They'd want to see the craters on the moon. They'd want to see the rings of Saturn. And they were just as excited as I was to see these things, mm -hmm. as excited as whenever I'd set up the telescope back home in Michigan. And it suddenly hit me. You know, a well-fed cow doesn't bother looking through a telescope. My very clever cat never wanted to see the rings of Jupiter. <laughs> this is something that only human beings do. Mm -hmm. This desire to see the universe, to be amazed by the beauty of the sky, to wonder about who we are and where we come from, and to recognize there's more to life than what's for lunch. Yes. This is a human experience. And if you deny it to somebody just because they were born in the wrong continent or with the wrong income, you're denying them their humanity. But when you can provide this to people, you are enriching their humanity. Just as much as theater or art or music or dance are things that only human beings do. Wondering about the universe and looking at the stars, it's a very human activity. Mm -hmm. And that's why you do astronomy, because you take, you need more than food to live. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's read, I read someplace, man does not live by bread alone. Right. It's mm -hmm. literally true. I was really bringing some part of humanity to people who had been hungry for it. 
And with that in mind, I was able to come back to the United States and I got a teaching job at a small college, smaller than uh, Appalachia State, at a little college called Lafayette College up in Pennsylvania, and I loved it. I loved teaching, I loved bringing the excitement of astronomy to my students, but I was missing one thing, and that was what I had in the Peace Corps, that standing for something bigger than just myself. And then the thought had, which I'd had in all my life, really, since I was a little kid, growing up a good Irish Catholic kid, Irish Italian Catholic kid, maybe I could join the Jesuits who had taught me in high school mm -hmm. and do this mm -hmm. teaching at a Jesuit university. So it would mean giving up research, just teaching, but that was fine. I was mm -hmm. happy doing that. I entered the Jesuits in 1989. I did my two years of, of a novitiate, a couple of years of studies. I entered as a brother. I'm not ordained. I can't lead prayer. Uh, I don't, you know, hear confessions or right. things like that. I'm just a member of the community doing the work of the community. And I was ready to find out, all right, where do they want to send me next? Would I go to Georgetown or Loyola or Boston College, one of the many Jesuit universities in this country? And when I asked, where do you want to send me? They said, don't bother, we just got a letter from Rome. You've been assigned to the Vatican Observatory. How do they even know I exist in Rome? Yes. You know, but they do. They, they knew my background, they knew I had a doctorate in astronomy. And so instead of teaching, which is what I thought I'd entered to do, under obedience, I had to go to Rome, look at that terrible scenery, <laughs> eat that awful food, and oh yes, do any research I wanted to do with mm -hmm. a thousand meteorites. Mm -hmm. it, in fact, it's been the time yeah. of my life yeah. and nothing I ever could have planned. When we first learned that you were coming to campus, and I was reading about this, and it was a great honor, and I saw an astronomer for the Vatican, and I thought, I didn't even know they had that. So that was a great surprise to me, and I've learned a lot mm -hmm. from this and having you here. So why do they have an astronomer at the Vatican? What's the, what's the role? Well, there's two roles, really. There's a simple one, which is just to be a sign that the church supports science, it not only is not afraid of science, but it embraces science. It says the study of the natural universe is the study of God's creation. And it's a beautiful way to get to know God, to mm -hmm. see how God created the universe. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ways God could have done it. Yes. To find out mm -hmm. the way that God chose to do it tells you something about God's personality. Mm -hmm. And we want to encourage people, if they've got the scientific bent, to go ahead and embrace it and not be afraid of the truth that you're going to learn in science, recognizing there's more to life than mm -hmm. science, but certainly science is an important and a wonderful part of it. Mm -hmm. There's a deeper message underneath it all, and that deeper message is the beauty, the elegance of the universe that is God speaking to us. Mm -hmm. So while there's the practical side, we want to show the world that the church embraces science, and in some sense, I'm an ambassador mm -hmm. to remind the scientists that the church supports them, also to remind the church people that science is not their enemy. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be their enemy. That's a very practical sense. Mm -hmm. But there's the deeper sense to recognize that this is one way we can hear God speaking to us. Mm -hmm. And you find that in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1. From the beginning of the universe, God has spoken to us through the things he has created. So sometimes we hear about conflicts between science and religion, but you're saying that's not necessarily so, that there's a deeper way of viewing this? Not only is it not necessarily so, historically it's never been the case. Okay. Um, science began in the universities. Who invented the universities? The church. Who supported the universities? The church. Who's the father of geology? Albert the Great, who was a monk. Who's the father of chemistry? Roger Bacon, who was a monk. Who is the guy who developed genetics? Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. Who was the first person to classify stars by their spectra? Angelo Secchi, a Jesuit priest. Who was the fellow who developed the Big Bang Theory? It was mm -hmm. George Lemaitre, a Belgian priest. Not only have there been priests and monks, but you can go to mm -hmm. the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society from the 17th century, the 18th century. Who's doing science in 1795? You look in the book and you realize it's noblemen, it's medical doctors, and it's clergymen. Mm -hmm. You know, an office science is just taking data, writing it down, putting in three by five cards, sorting, classifying. Well, this, this plant has three leaves, that plant has four leaves. What do we call that kind of work? 
It's clerical work. Mm -hmm. Why is it called clerical? Because traditionally it was done by clerics. Science used to be done by clergymen. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the last hundred years, and it became a profession where you could make money at it, that the non-clergy came in. And I think some of them were a little jealous of the clergy and maybe started to invent this, oh, we're better than them because we're not tied down by the church. When in fact, that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you another funny story. When I became a scientist, most of my friends didn't know I was religious, you know, and mm -hmm. in the culture of science and the culture of the North where I come from, you don't normally talk about your religion. You consider that's very private. So most people didn't know my religion. When I put on the collar for the first time, showed up at a meeting as a Jesuit brother, I had been a scientist 15, 20 years by then, I was wondering what kind of reaction am I gonna get from my friends? I was not prepared to hear everybody say, that's so wonderful, that's great. But even more, people who I had no idea what their background was, they came up to me and started telling me about the churches they belonged to. And I realized, in my field of astronomy at least, the proportion of scientists who belong to a church pretty much mirrors the culture they come from. You know, in the Midwest, I'd say half the scientists I know are churchgoers. Mm -hmm. In England, it's maybe 10%, because mm -hmm. not too many people in England go to church anymore. It's, you know, culture to culture. It has nothing to do with whether you're a scientist or not. Right. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes you wonder, where does this idea of science and religion at war even come from? Because mm -hmm. I don't experience it. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced it. I remember as a child, it was almost like magic to go out and lay on the ground and look up and just look at the stars. Um, now, why, why, do I, why would one have that attraction? And I think a lot of people feel that way. You know, in, in the beautiful area in which we live here in Boone, North Carolina, I mean, you look up at night on a clear night, and it is, it's magical it is. what you're looking at. And honestly, at times I will, I'm looking, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but you mm -hmm. find yourself attracted. Is that speaking to something inner me, an inner person? Why I is really it that way? So. Um, St. Ignatius, the fellow who founded the Jesuit order that I belong mm -hmm. to, says exactly the same thing you said in his autobiography. He said, I used to just go out and look at the stars and feel the call of God. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that no dog or cat is going to be able to do. It's only human beings do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's an expression of what the theologian Karl Rahner refers to as the desire for the transcendent. That when we look at the immensity of the universe and at the beauty that we recognize in the universe, we feel this desire for something outside ourselves, this desire that points us in the direction of God. And we also have to ask, where is that desire coming from? Because God is also within us, mm -hmm. feeding that desire. Mm -hmm. This is his way of trying to speak to us. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about astronomy is you don't have to have an education right. to have right. that marvelous feeling. Mm -hmm. But if you do have an education, if you do study the stars, if you do learn how to use a telescope, you get it even more, mm -hmm. and you get it even deeper. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the light of the stars is beautiful, but Maxwell's mm -hmm. equations that describe how that light, light. works, yes. that's yes. also beautiful, mm -hmm. and it just never stops. Tell me about this, this type of research, your area of specialty in meteorites. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in that, and tell me about some of your research there. Well, I started with a professor. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody can look back to mm -hmm. one really great professor they had. And this one guy who taught me meteoritics, a fellow named John Lewis at MIT, he was such a dynamic professor that I would wake up every Tuesday and Thursday and say, I get to go to class today. Mm -hmm. It would get me out of bed, get me moving. Uh -huh. Not many professors will do that, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Beyond that, I began to realize how this was a way that I could touch outer space to realize that that blue sky is not some impenetrable barrier that separates me from the universe, but that bits of the universe come through it to a place where I can hold them. When I got to the Vatican, I discovered they had a collection of a thousand meteorites, and there was a private collector's collection. It was not big samples of one, but a little bit of everything. And I was trying to think, what's the kind of research I could do with a collection like that? One of the questions that I'd always had with my theoretical research before then was modeling how planets, how stars, how asteroids change with time. I needed to know the density of the material that went into them to calculate how much stuff was there. Nobody had measured densities of meteorites. Mm -hmm. So I developed 
what I thought was a pretty clever way of measuring it. Now, what's a density? You know, when, when you're having Christmas and there's a bunch of presents, in the, I remember as a little kid at Christmas time, mm -hmm. I was allowed to open one present before we went off to church. Yes. You wanted to make sure it had candy, not a pair of socks in it. Yeah. So you'd pick it up, and the light ones, that socks. The mm -hmm. heavy ones, the dense ones, that's candy. Yeah. The same thing you're doing with a Christmas present, I want to be able to do with planets. I want to tell what they're made out of by how dense they are, how much mm -hmm. stuff is packed inside the box. So you've got to weigh it to know how dense, it, how heavy it is. And then you've got to measure the size of the container, the size of the meteorite. Mm -hmm. The way I do that is by taking a cup, known volume, fill it with glass beads. I got the idea from the sugar you put into a cappuccino. That's okay. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's the benefit of living in Italy. So you use little white glass beads, fill up the cup, you, you weigh it, and then you put the meteorite in and you fill it up with the same beads. The meteorite and the beads are gonna weigh a little bit more and you can use a little bit of mathematics to calculate how much more, what is the density of the rock compared to the density of the beads. And the beads don't hurt the rock, you brush them off when you're done, and you've got a wonderful answer. So it's so simple and so fast that we have measured thousands of different meteorites. All right, we've got all these densities, what good is that? You can compare that against the asteroids out in space, out beyond Mars where they come from, and you discover that the asteroids are only half the density of the meteorites. We used to think asteroids are just big rocks. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're piles of rubble. They're very loose piles of sand and rock. And this raises all sorts of new questions as to how they got that way, what they're made out of, what things happened to them when they were being formed. Also, if someday you want to go up to those asteroids and start mining them for minerals, this is useful to know that you're not going to need to take TNT with you, but just a, a, a shovel and a bucket. Oh. And mm. basically, it allows us to see the objects in our own solar system in a new way, in a deeper way we ne would never have thought of before. Mm -hmm. You get to know them just mm -hmm. a little bit better. Well, what about the discussions that we hear sometimes from, again, the television, um, that one is going to hit us one day, it's going to take out the Earth, um, and it's on a target now. And if this thing is as loosely formed as I sort of understand from what you're saying, does it have that much force that it could actually take out the Earth? Well, it's not going to take out the Earth, but it could take out life on Earth. Um, what are the odds that it's going to happen? The odds are certain. What are the odds it's going to happen tomorrow? Oh, one in a hundred million. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, okay. you know, if you're really worried about asteroids killing, there are two things you can do. Stop smoking, wear your seatbelt. Because trust me, those are much more dangerous than any yeah. asteroid. Um, beyond that, we are learning where the asteroids are so that if one is coming close to us, we can figure out what to do about it. Mm -hmm. By knowing how they're put together, we can come up with better strategies for deflecting it a little bit. If we have a long enough lead tide, you'll be able to you know, just slowly move it out of the Earth's path. And I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but 50 years or 100 years from now, we may find one that's coming close enough. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the more that the human population covers the Earth, the more targets we're providing to the asteroids. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, one of them's going to hit, and probably won't be a big one, probably won't end all life on Earth, but it might be a ding in somebody's city. Mm -hmm. We know from observing in the last 100 years, we've had a couple of big impacts hit the Earth, the Tunguska and mm -hmm. Siberia and 1909, and there was one over Russia in 1948. You know, either of these, if they had actually landed where people live, mm -hmm. we'd know about it. Right. So, so far it hasn't happened. We've been lucky. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, God's given us the intelligence to track these things and mm -hmm. figure out what to do about them. So I think we ought to use that intelligence. Mm -hmm. A question I have read a little bit about you that I understand that you like to be asked and have been asked <laughs> quite a few times here. And so I don't want to disappoint you and I certainly mm -hmm. want the viewers to hear this um, because you're a fan of, of science fiction and a question that you have uh, entertained many times is would you baptize an alien? So brother guy, <laughs> would you? Okay, would you? Well, uh, the, the best short answer is only if they ask. Okay. And I think it's a real answer because mm -hmm. the whole question is not really one that has a simple yes, no. 
it's one of these mysteries you contemplate. It makes you wonder, well, what is the point of baptism? What does it really mean to be baptized? Why do I ask if something has a soul? How would I know? How would I know if they were asking? What is the nature of the soul? You know, Thomas Aquinas says uh, free will and intellect, so that a soul is an entity that's aware of its existence, aware of other existences, can choose to love or not love or close the doors and ignore. Thinking about that makes you realize that could be true of creatures other than us. On the other hand, what's the point of baptism? Something to do with original sin, something to do with the need for salvation. Would other creatures need salvation? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's why science fiction is so much fun, because you mm -hmm. can play with the ideas, saying right up front, this is fiction. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming this is true. But if this was true, how would it work out? How, what would happen? And then what would happen? And then what would happen? And do I think that's likely or not? And then you say, all right, well, maybe something else is true, and you play it out in that direction. Mm -hmm. In the process of doing that, I doubt that I'm ever going to come across an alien in my lifetime, mm. but I am going to come across human souls. Mm. I am going to come across my own soul. And by asking these wonderful games, this mm. wonderful what-if game, I'm allowing myself to think a little bit more about what it means that I have a soul, what it means that I have been baptized and to appreciate it in a new and a different way that I might not have appreciated before. Before we went on the air, I was asking you a question, and you gave me an answer, and I really wasn't expecting the mm -hmm. answer that I received. And so I just want to kind of share that, because there's a great, um, I guess a lot of people in this area seem to really focus on the horoscope. Mm -hmm. And it's in the paper every day. It's there, and there you are. Um, so a two-point question, first of all, what do you think about the horoscopes? And then recently, and you educated me on this, there's been discussion about another category. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing with you that impacted my, my <laughs> own horoscope. And mm -hmm. um, so, and, but you said that has been discussed and, and oh, yeah. there for a long time. But I just saw it in the newspaper a few weeks ago. And then I heard people are talking about it, sure. I heard yeah. a lot of conversation about it mm -hmm. since then. Somebody said that upsets my whole schedule because I thought I was, <laughs> and now I'm something right. else. Right. You know, what do you think about all that? Well, first of all, there's an important thing to remember. There's nothing in the Bible that specifically talks about evolution that says it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. But there is specific places in the Bible that forbids horoscopes and forbids astrology. You can find it in a number of places in the Old Testament. And that's because the idea that the stars control our destiny or control who we are or what we're like is forbidden. It violates God's power and it violates our free will. So to hold that this horoscope is somehow going to control your life, it's really, it's a cop-out. It's saying, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do what I need to do. So there's something just wrong morally about it mm -hmm. to begin with. Beyond that, it doesn't work. Uh, one of the great things you can do in astronomy classes, and I hope I'm not giving away secrets to kids who are coming into an astronomy class, the, the professor will say, everybody in the class, write down your birth date and the time of day, and you know, we'll work out your horoscopes for you. And he comes in the next class, and he gives each student their name with a description of, you are born under the, and so on. What the kids don't realize as they're all reading it and they're saying, oh yeah, that's me, boy, that's me. He says, all right, how many people think this is right? They all raise their hand. Trade with your neighbors and they discover that they've all been reading the same piece of paper. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because it's a charlatan's trick. Mm -hmm. You can write things that are so general that if you want to believe it, you'll read into it. Oh yeah, handsome, that's me, right. Whatever, mm -hmm. I don't know the tricks, but mm -hmm. horoscopes, they're immoral and they don't work. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, if you yeah. still want to go along with them. <laughs> yeah. Now, what the horoscope was based on was the position of the sun and the planets as they're moving through the sky. And of course, that's real. There is a sun, there are planets, there are constellations. The constellations are given names mostly by people who could see in the pattern of stars and as a way to remember them. Oh, that reminds mm -hmm. me of a lion. Oh, that reminds me of two stick figures that look like twins. About 80 years ago, the International Astronomical Union, the, the group that has to make these arbitrary decisions, decided, okay, if we're going to have constellations as a way of keeping track of what stars are where for naming the stars, mm -hmm. here's where we're going to draw the boundaries. It's very arbitrary. As it happens, those boundaries so overlap 
that the constellation Ophiuchus actually has the sun going through it for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that there's now a new zodiac constellation of Ophiuchus. Mm -hmm. It was an arbitrary place where they drew the lines. Not only that, but all of the astrology that people like to use dates from 2,000 years ago. But the stars have slowly shifted compared to the sun's position over those 2,000 years. That's why we had to reform the calendar in 1582. Mm -hmm. And so, when your horoscope says that the sun was in Gemini, in fact, the sun hasn't been in Gemini in that month for a thousand years. Uh, if you remember the 60s, those of us mm -hmm. with gray hair will mm -hmm. remember it. You know that old song about the age of Aquarius? Yes. It's exactly yeah. about the shifting of the constellations. Right. So this is nothing new. We've known mm -hmm. this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, one of these things gets on the internet, and then everybody gets excited for a week, and then they forget it. So when my horoscope says that a close friend will come and share some wonderful news with right. me that day, I shouldn't wait with bated breath expecting that person to come. Because you hope that you have close friends visiting you every day, and I hope well, you get mm -hmm. wonderful news every day. True. Mm -hmm. Why not? As we get close to the end, I want to ask you if you've had a chance to visit some of the uh, facilities here at Appalachian State, the yes. wonderful dark sky observatory that mm -hmm. we have and then uh, Rankin Science, the, the rooftop with the rollback roof to oh it. Oh my, yes. Have you seen that? I and just was there about an hour ago, mm -hmm. and it's jaw-dropping. Mm -hmm. It is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I only wish that I had had that kind of stuff when I was studying astronomy. Yeah, it's, the, mm -hmm. the facilities that the kids have now, mm -hmm. and the ability to do real science with mm -hmm. these telescopes. You know, it's not just yes. playing around, but mm -hmm. With these facilities, of course, you're blessed to be in a dark part of the world. Mm -hmm. Light pollution is killing astronomy in mm -hmm. so many parts of the world. And it's really important to keep the lights down here mm -hmm. so you can see the mm -hmm. sky that God gave us mm -hmm. rather than the lights that you know, the local electric mm -hmm. company is giving us. It's, yeah, you know, I'm not going to worship the local electric company, right. nice as they may be. <laughs> right. But yeah, the fact that the kids can now see, I mean, it's, just, it's just astonishing. Anybody who's not been to a star night here, should come and visit because mm -hmm. it is so beautiful and it is a wonderful thing that you don't need a full education to appreciate what it looks like to see Saturn through mm -hmm. a telescope. But once you've seen Saturn through a telescope, mm -hmm. maybe you're going to want a little more of that education. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Well, Brother Guy, that means a lot to hear you, the astronomer for the Vatican, to say that we have great facilities here at Appalachian to explore this wonderful world that we have. Well, great facilities and great astronomers here as well. Yes. Uh, we've got Richard Gray has collaborated with us at the Vatican at our telescope in Arizona yes. many mm -hmm. times. And it was that personal connection of knowing his astronomy connected, you know, he's worldwide mm -hmm. famous himself. Mm -hmm. So, and the other astronomers here in the department, you know, mm -hmm. that's the attraction of having them here that of course made me eager to come and visit. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want you to leave Appalachian, but the time will come. When that comes, do you mm -hmm. go back to Arizona? Do you go back to Italy? What's Well, I've got work? a few more talks to go, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be at one or two more institutions. I'll have a week to visit my parents in Florida. Wonderful. My dad is going to be 93 in April, wow. and he's doing great. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to Europe, and I'll be working with the meteorites for a few more months. Great. But I, I tend to hop back and forth. Okay. Okay. Well, it's been wonderful having you on the show, and thank you. It's been great having you part of Appalachian State. You know, come back. It's a tremendous honor to have you here. It and has been I, a delight. I appreciate you. your presence on our campus and your, your classes that you've taught. We've, we've worked you hard. I've seen the schedule. <laughs> so we don't give you any free time because we're so proud to have you here. We want to just well, get every, every bit of information from you that we possibly can. It's every moment I can be with the students and the teachers here has been a joy. Great. Well, thank Thanks you, Brother so Guy. Thank you so much. Thank you All for right. being part of Appalachia. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.